Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, welcome to the Road to Recovery webinar. Today, I'll just share my screen quickly. <laughs> So welcome to the Road to Recovery. Today, I'm Margot Smith, the CEO of the RSL and Services Clubs Association. And today I'm joined by Julian Black, Group Account Manager at Lion, and Steve Sid, Co-Founder of Hospitality Genie. Um, we are having a couple of IT issues today. So if um, at any time you see a bit of a freezing or anything, just bear with us and uh, we'll muddle through. Thank you for registering. Uh, it is an important topic and one I know that many people are interested to hear a little bit more about today. We'll come at it from a couple of different angles and I'll let Steve and Julian um, tell you a bit more about uh, them and uh, their approach and what they, they will tackle. Um, so Steve will start off and um, do a bit of a uh, presentation and then Julian will and please save any questions. I'll save any questions for the end but use the chat box absolutely to um, pop some through as we go. So we'd love to make this as interactive as possible. We've earmarked a little bit of time for um, the presentations, but we've um, allocated a fair chunk for any questions you may have, because um, it's fair to say that, uh, it, you know, the pandemic is the gift that keeps on giving and, um, you know, floods and all sorts of things. So anything that we can do to help you to navigate the various changes, dynamics across staffing, pricing, margins, any automation, you know, we'd love to provide some insights um, with you today. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Steve and stop sharing my screen, Steve. And um, if you can um, tell everyone a little bit more about hospitality, Jamie. Sure. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And as Marga said, I'm Steve Seed. I'm one of the co-founders for Hospitality Genie. Um, I actually wear two hats in the business. Um, just to give you a bit of uh, intel and, and insight about myself, uh, I also run a catering business, uh, which runs 11 clubs, 26 different dining concepts and over 40 event spaces um, in, in Sydney and, and Greater Sydney. Um, and over the last two years during COVID, uh, we acquired um, and joined with Hospitality Genie, which is a holistic software solution, which really helps a lot of automation, uh, price control, uh, supply chain, compliance checklist. So it's a, a tool that can be used across um, food and beverage uh, in the hospitality industry and obviously clubs. Uh, and as we're so prominent in clubs, we use it quite heavily within our venues as well. And hence why I wanted to share that today with you and, and, and give you a bit of a snapshot about Hospitality Genie because I myself is very proud of the software. Um, we use it every day. Our teams use it. You know, we employ 350 staff. And all of our teams use Hospitality Genie to, to help us run our business and really tighten control across the group. So um, I'm going to share my screen now because I'd love to give you a bit of a snapshot about Hospitality Genie. So just bear with me for one moment. Can everyone see my screen okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with um, one of the key areas of Hospitality Genie. And one of these um, areas which is really important for you know, the teams at your venues to be able to, you know, completely track um, food costs, beverage costs. And, you know, in every business at the moment, it's all about that bottom line and profitability. And it's important that we can make as much profit as we can to help us, you know, get through this pandemic and really tighten those processes. And that's what we've done over the last two years is really try to improve our efficiencies in the business. So, Whenever your teams log on to Hospitality Genie, the first thing they see is these dashboards. Um, and again, I get very warm and fuzzy and I'm quite passionate about it because it's a tool that's been very successful in our business. Uh, so the snapshot helps them, you know, to evaluate where their food cost is, where their spend is, where their budget is. And it's a really snapshot. And as you can see in front of me, in front on the screen, you know, you can have it as different profit centers. You can drill down to, you know, if you have different um, dining areas or bars within your club, you can drill down to those different areas in the different profit centers. So you can actually look at it here as I've got here as a global dashboard, or I can actually drill down to a specific venue. Um, or as I said, a different profit center within your within your organization. So it's a, one of the this is one of the key elements of of hospitality journey is these dashboards and reporting. Now, where all this information does come from um, is some different multiple areas of of Genie. 
We have an area which is your daily sales reports. Um, so all your daily sales is actually linked uh, through your POS. So all your sales data is being drilled and pulled in from the POS, uh, which is, again, is live data. Um, and that then calculates how, you know, where the food cost and your beverage cost comes from. So all the sales is actually being drilled in from your POS and it's all integrated. So that's a really good tool. And as I said, it gives you that live data. One of the other key elements is uh, the supply chain. Um, so all of your suppliers um, uh, uh, put their pricing within Genie. We use it as our purchase order uh, software where all of our chefs, our bar staff, our catering staff can place their orders with their suppliers. And I'm gonna choose a supplier and I wanna go through this process with you uh, on how this process works. So I'm gonna use Reliable Foods here, which is one of my dry goods supplier. Um, all the products are sitting uh, in the back end of Genie, all the products, all those prices, all the codes for that supply chain. Now, we know, you know in, in large organizations, there's people that manage you know, the, the stores or the loading dock, or your stores person, your purchasing officer. And a lot of times they're negotiating pricing with their suppliers. So once they negotiate those prices, what we find is um, a delivery may come to the dock, somebody signs off on that invoice, invoice goes to accounts department and it gets paid. However, how do we know are we getting the prices that we've negotiated with? With Hospitality Genie, the way we've customized it is those prices are locked in. So the purchase order gets sent to the supplier, um, it, they received it on their end, that it is a purchase order with the products and those prices. When the supplier then creates that invoice. What they can do is they can update our purchase order based on quantities and not price. Again, this is all about really tightening that process that the price negotiations is what you've negotiated is, is what you actually pay for. So when the supplier then uh, automatically uh, receives a purchase order, they create a delivery. Now that delivery, and I'm, I might be going a little bit fast here, but I'm trying to give everyone a bit of a snapshot. So excuse me if I'm trying, because there's a lot to cover, but I'm trying to keep it to a, a limited time. Um, so when a, when a supplier uploads their delivery into the system, they can upload their invoice. So it's all in the back end. Now that invoice matches our purchase order. Now, the only time that it will not match is if they've changed, as I said, a quantity. For some reason, they might have a stock item missing. It might be out of stock. They will then obviously reduce that down to a zero value, but that will reduce our purchase order. So their invoice will exactly match. The supplier cannot upload an invoice to the back end of Genie unless it is dollar for dollar. So as I said, they can change quantity, but they cannot change price. When, our, when the delivery lands on the dock, um, one of our staff members, whether it's your stores person, your purchasing officer, your, your head chef, whoever it is, they can go through the actual delivery and cross check it against what has been sitting on the dock. We've just launched a new app, um, which is available on Android and Apple. Again, very warm and fuzzy about it because it's an exciting time for Hospitality Genie. Um, so that your staff can do it on the, an app, on a tablet, uh, on their phones, and they can go through that delivery and mark off every item on that delivery. Once that delivery is approved, um, they approve it and it gets sent to the accounts department. This reduces a huge amount of data entry. The paper invoice becomes irrelevant now. So we're processing nearly two and a half thousand invoices a week. Our invoices don't even go to head office anymore because everything is now automated. From Genie, once this invoice is approved, it then gets exported to our backend. We use Xero as our accounting software, but it can be integrated with multiple different softwares. But the invoice becomes void because that paper invoice is no longer required. It's all automated. It's saving a huge amount of data entry. Uh, and obviously there's no missing invoices and no uh, price, um, price alerts or, or, or discrepancies with prices. So that's another element of Hospitality Genie. Another area that I wanna to touch on is, again, when the suppliers need to um, add a new product uh, to Hospitality Genie. Uh, for instance, uh, a chef may say, we wanna put a special on, we might wanna put beef cheeks on as a special tonight. You, uh, we, need, we need that product in Genie. So our policy is if the product is not available in Genie, it's very simple. The chefs can't order that product or your bars, whoever it, who's doing those orders. <clears throat> so what we do is we ask uh, the supplier to upload their products into Genie. We will get a notification, no, notification, a notification email to let us know that there's been a new product added. 
Um, and I, I've, as you can see here, it's a new product notification in Genie. Uh, and I, as you can see, I've got a new product there from Pullis Brothers, which is a seafood supplier. I can simply click on that. They've added the products there and I can either approve it or decline it. So what this does for me, and I'm just gonna show you how I'm gonna approve these and decline some of them as well. So what this does, once I approve it, that will automatically get added to Genie and it will notify the supplier that we've approved those products. It reduces all that data entry yet again. So the supplier now uploads the products, the codes, the quantities, and obviously the price. A really, really good tool and a very easy system to use. Another part is also price changes. Um, as we all know, in the current climate, in the current um, climate that we're dealing with with pricing, it's continuously changing. Prices go up, prices go down. Again, when there's a new price, we do get notified if there's a new price and hopefully it's price is going down, not up, but at the moment it's mainly going up. And again, I'll show you here, I've got Habrix Meats has sent me a notification. Again, I can click on here. I can see that the what the current price is, what the new price is, the price change and what percentage that is. And it's up to me now to either approve it or reject it. And again, the supplier will be notified as soon as we go, we, we update that price point. All this data, as I said, gets feeds into, you know, obviously your dashboards, uh, which is great. Um, and also it updates your recipe cards as well. So with the recipe cards, when you've got your chefs or your, you know, your beverage manager processing, uh, you know, recipes, this will automatically upload those recipe with, uh, with your cost of goods. And I'm going to give you an example. If I go to my milk bar burger here, it shows me, uh, what the, the recipe is. It shows me which venues and how much we're charging for it. So it gives me a sale price, the sale price XGST, what the cost is per portion, my profit, and obviously what my margins are. So every time there's been a price change on the back end with those products, it will automatically feed into my recipe cards. So if I want to review my menu, my recipe cards every month or every three months, it shows me which menu items need to shift in price. Do they need to go up? Do they need to go down to be able to absorb the increase in prices? Everything is tracked, as I said, in, uh, in Genie. Um, it's a very simple tool to be able to cost your recipes. No longer you need an Excel, no longer guessing games, no longer a chef having to remember what we pay for what products. Everything is in Hospitality Genie. It's a really good, easy tool uh, for your staff and for your business to run. Uh, I'm just going to touch on another area, which is the compliance checklist as well. Uh, again, this is for your staff, your chefs, um, your different duty managers that within the club, again, that can sign off on inspections, whether it's the cleanliness in the kitchen, whether it's temperature checks, whether it's the bars that are, you know, the bar fridges have been stocked or they've been cleaned, they can be workflows. Hospitality Genie is a holistic system, has a holistic solution to your business, and it can control your day-to-day -day operation. This is the, the main tool for the business to run, um, and it helps with all the, the reduced time that is spent in paperwork and without having you know, the, the data at hand, this is all automated and it's at your fingertips. It's a really great solution. Um, and as I said, it, it really helps my business. And as I said, we run 11 clubs, 26 different dining concepts and employ 350 staff. And this is our go-to. So I'm really proud to, to present it to, to, to the organization today. Thank you, Steve. That was a whirlwind. Um, <laughs> lots of information. Sounds a like information. a heap of automation that can be done, cost control, um, I guess takes a lot of that guesswork out. And how often do we check that, you know, what we've uh, thought we've been quoted on something is what we've paid. So um, super efficient and um, a great way to cost control and, and look at the supply chain and everything. Thank you. Like I said, type in any questions into the Q&A. Um, I'll now um, see if Julian can switch his camera back on board and I'll do a screen share. Um, like I said, um, we have had a couple of technical issues, so just bear with us. Um, never work with kids, animals and technology, I always say, just to keep life interesting. <laughs> I'll just get the slides to share. As per usual, I've got sorry, too many screens open, it would seem. Let's just see. Go. 
Thanks. Thanks, Margot. Apologies for putting a lot of people under a bit of stress for the last half an hour. I've tried everything, <laughs> Wi-Fi, hotspotting, hotspotting off other devices and just nothing. So um, apologies, but I think we've got there in the end. So fingers crossed. My name's Julian Black. Thanks for the introduction, Margot. I work for Lions. So I've been with Lion for 10 years as group accounts manager. So I manage a team of five key account managers across New South Wales who manage approximately 70 RSL club pub groups and also um, that stretches across around 500 odd venues. So today, next page please, Margot, we're gonna go through three main areas. So the first one being um, market conditions and trends, um, followed by maximizing your revenue and margin through product and promotion. And then thirdly, training and sustainability. So we can go down to the next page, please, and look at the economic outlook. So I'm certainly not here today to say that I am an economist or anything of that nature. Um, but what we're seeing on the page here is a couple of insights in regards to the ability to spend. So looking at a consumer's point of view and at the ability for them to spend and their willingness to spend. So um, green is obviously positive, grey is neutral, and red is, of course, negative. So with the top um, boxes there, the ability to spend, we have population wages growth, both as positive and then house prices and stock market as, as a neutral. Um, there's a lot of green on the page when it comes to the willingness to spend. So GDP, unemployment and savings rate, although there is some fear around the cash rate, which is red. So obviously, as we've seen in the media a lot over the last um, couple of couple of weeks about inflation, housing prices, stock market, you know, there might be a little bit more red now than when this was actually done in April. Um, so the info, this information is consistent with what we see across the on-premise. So customer frequency of visitation has dropped, um, but spend, um, but premiumization of spend is high. So people are making higher margin purchases, but but less or fewer transactions. Next page, please. So what we can see here in terms of the on-premise outlook is a survey that was taken back in March this year and shows con consumer sentiment when it comes to routines and spending on categories, or more specifically, treating themselves to nights out or travel. So the good news is that travel, holidays, restaurants and dining out um, in bars, clubs and pubs are the biggest area of planned spend for the future. So 18 months ago, these stats would have been completely the opposite and upside down. So you would have been seeing the outdoor living and the electronics, which are lower on the scale now as the ones at the top. So more people are keen to get back out into the on-premise and travel. So the great news from this survey shows um, that, you know, in, in March, Travel, dining out are the biggest items for people to spend on um, looking towards the future. Next page, please. This is another slide showing consumer sentiment, taking in some data from May, asking respondents over the past month, have they been visiting the on-premise to eat or drink? So 22% of the respondents said that they're visiting um, to eat or drink more than usual. 65 is the same as usual and 13% is less than usual. So that 13% is the, is, the, is the number of consumers that we need to try and disrupt and make sure that when they are coming into our venues, that they are impressed, that we're servicing them well, we give them good quality and safe um, environment for them to spend their time and ensuring that they will have a positive um, time when they're in trade um, and in venue so that they do come back more often. Next page. This information is showing more so looking, looking, um, looking back. So 87% of consumers have eaten out in the past month, whereas only 47% of consumers have been out for a drink in the past month. So what this is telling us is that pre-COVID, the propensity to have a drink went out was a lot higher. So the the post work drinks have fallen away from CBDs. And that's certainly impacting these numbers whereby people are going out. Some people are abstaining from drinking, but there's a lot more people out, more focused on eating. And then the drink is a complement to the food. 
So food is close to back to pre-COVID levels, but the drinks isn't quite there. So it, it is building though and will improve over time. Uh, the opportunity, yeah, the key question is though, will it will we ever get back to those pre-COVID levels? And it, it looks like that might be unlikely at this stage due to the way that people are working with that hybrid model, going into the office occasionally and working from home a lot more. So the big opportunity is for the suburban clubs and pubs is attracting these hybrid workers who would usually be in CBD offices and get them back into your venues um, to have those occasions in your venues, whether it be on a, on, you know, a Thursday, Friday after work. So can you create those after work occasions for these people? This slide shows more trends looking forward. So the, the result has improved. So 91% of consumers looking forward do plan on going out in the next month, while 55% look will be going out for a drink. So you can see that there's been an improvement when people are planning um, you know, future, future nights out or times out. Um, so this is highlighting definitely the trajectory that consumers are planning to be in the on-premise more in the future. And now that now the role we have is to how can we make sure that everyone when they're out, that they're having a good fun time in a safe quality environment. So a couple more stats here. So one in five consumers, this is probably getting more into, you know, what people are, are doing and drinking and, and how we need to um, disrupt them when they are in venue with quality um, menus, et cetera. So one in five consumers make a decision on what they want to drink before they even enter a venue so if i go to a pub i go okay well i know that i'm going to have a two-ish new or a stone and wood pacific ale before i go in there but this leaves four in five consumers who are still open to influence so you know that that's that's up to bar staff it's up to management it's obviously up to the venues to make sure that when they get to the bar and that point of connection or the point of purchase that there's something there that's going to entice them to, to purchase a drink and not just sort of order food. So we'll go into a few of the ways that we can do that now. So menus are the number one factor when it comes to influencing choice. So ensuring that you have an easy to read menu with a good layout and clear pricing is crucial. Having a menu that's accessible online is also super important as 20% of people will check the menu online as a key driver of making a choice as to whether they're going to attend that venue. So if you haven't got any online presence and you haven't got your menus up there, that is really should be a consideration for the future because I know I, when I go out for dinner, I'm always sort of checking a menu and getting excited. What am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? What's the cocktails like, et cetera. And a lot of other people do that as well. So it's something that I'd really recommend you doing and not just put your wine list or your spirits, your cocktails, et cetera, on there. Put, put your range of beers put what you know bottled beers you have as well like it's important that people can see exactly what they've got because so the repertoire of people's drinks now has increased a lot with so much choice now in the market promotions and deals play a big role as well as we as you'll see soon consumers want to see changes in deals and the opportunity to try new things that are on special so if you can rotate your specials more frequently and give that value shopper more, a more reason to try other things and then when it comes off special, you might have just got them to a higher price point of drinking than they were at previously. And they wouldn't have gone there or they wouldn't have tried that drink unless it might have been on promotion. The visibility of drinks and how a beer is poured and presented is also a great way to get your punters interested. Next page, Margot. What we're seeing now is a couple of things. So this is showing which parts of the menu help, help consumers decide what they want to drink in venue. So price and drink descriptions are by far the most, most important um, areas or, or components that will help drive a, a consumer's decision-making. You really need to nail these top two things based on what consumers are telling us. So consumers are more discerning now, as I mentioned before. They want to know more about what they're putting in their body. They want to know the cost that they're going to be outlaying for a certain drink, and that's really, that's really making their um, buying decisions uh, and driving their buying decisions. Pricing architecture is another thing that I'll touch on. So what I mean by that is instead of having, you know, all of your beers at the one price or only having a couple of levels of pricing for your beer, we'd really encourage you to consider at least having three pricing levels for your beer. 
So you might have one for mid strength, you might have another one for classic and contemporary beers. So whether it's two is new and hard, super dry, and then another level for your contemporary, your craft and your premium beers. A lot of pubs will do, you know, each segment will have a different price. Um, in clubs, you know, we would recommend that as well because consumers are very much used to paying more for a more quality um, or crafty beer or contemporary beer that's sort of, you know, got those new age um, flavours to them. Next page, please. So in regards to promotions and deals, which one stands out the most and influences customers to purchase? So specials like beers of the month work the best. So then oldie but a goodie. Um, but if you have long-term specials that go for, you know, two, more, two or more months, the price becomes just the price. So you need to mix it up and change the specials so those value hunters will be, will be able to change their behaviour and you can get them to trade up to higher margin products and add more value to your bottom line. You need to keep it relevant for those, um, those people who are value hunters, but also encourage those transient shoppers to try new products. Perceived value is also worth exploring. People assume if you've got a, um, if it's more, ex people assume it's more expensive. If you've, if you've got a Heineken on at $8 and a new one at $5, the value perception of the Heineken is higher than what the value perception of the two is new is. So you don't necessarily have to, have to have a huge discount for your beer um, or your beer of the month for it to be a promotion. Because consumer, if they see a tap, a tap talker on top of a tap decal, and it might be a slight reduction on what the actual schooner or the pint price is, they perceive that as a promotion and will be more inclined to purchase it. So don't just think you've got to really just drop the guts out of your pricing for a consumer to value, to perceive that as the value um, or, or a good value purchase. And that, that will also help you maximise your margin. Next page. So now we're just looking at a bit of um, some demographics. Um, so 25 to 49 year olds make up almost 50% of drinkers and spend more. The 50 to 69 year old demographic remain the largest share of drinkers and have more drinking occasions, but they do spend less. So no doubt there's many of the, um, the, you know, the clubs on the, on the line here that that would be a prominent age group within your clubs. Um, so the, the, the key question is how do we make sure that we keep their visitation up? We know that they're drinking, but how do we try and get them to spend a little bit more when they're in venues? So potentially like a multi-buy, a food and meal deal, these types of things can help encourage people to stay in the venue longer and get that one or two extra drinks out of them or potentially buying an entree um, with their main or a dessert, for example. So um, that's something that, yeah, definitely worth considering because that age group is definitely very prevalent um, in venues um, and their share of occasions is high. Now we're going to get a little bit more specific now into some brand trends and what's happening in the market. I understand that Seltz is probably quite new and might not even be ranged in a lot of these, in these clubs. Um, however, it by far is the fastest growing category or alcohol segment. Um, over the last three years globally. So 22% of the 22,500 respondents to this survey have said that seltzer was the drink that they would be more frequently drinking in the next 12 months. So thankfully for Lyme, we have the number one seltzer um, being White Claw, and we're also, um, we're also launching a bar and bay seltzer as well. Um, which is on tap. I think my PDF there might not have worked with those stats, but you can at least see what the brands are um, and you've got the info there. So Seltzer, the key message is Seltzer is definitely something you should consider um, moving forward in terms of product ranging in your fridges and potentially on tap. As you can see, the Byron Bay Seltzer there is on tap and we're going to be starting selling that in shortly um, around the, the nation. Some more stats on, on Seltzer. So in the USA, the Seltzer category is expected to reach 49.4 billion by 2028. And in 2021 alone, 300 new Seltzers were launched in the US market. So it's, 
extraordinary how big the, the category is um, and Australia is on the same on the same path obviously with a much smaller population but you know in Australia it's expected to be a 300 million dollar value segment by 2025 and I know you know if you go into a Dan Murphy's and you have a look at the the range of seltzers that they've got in there you know you're blown away with the amount of choice so it's certainly an area that um, if you want to be attracting that younger demographic into your venue definitely consider having a range of these obviously we'd love you to have the white claw as the primary one being the number one seltzer in in australia and we've got four um four flavors through um that that brand now we'll touch on some zero alcohol um stats so zero alcohol and another big trend um smaller in terms of size and value of of seltzer however still big so 140, $141 million in retail sales, um, 66% growth um, and 56 million in added growth to the grocery and liquor category, which is which is massive, right? So, you know, historically beer cider has been on a, a downwards trend. So really for the, for the alcohol category to get back to where, you know, it used to be, it's all through innovation. Everything is down to innovation. So seltzer, non zero alk. Um, you know, there's going to be more categories launching over the next few years. So yeah, if you want to be trying to um, encourage the the younger demographic into your clubs, you you've really got to look at what what you're ranging and and ranging brands and products that are going to excite them. Okay, so we'll go through now in terms of ma maximizing your revenue and margin through product and promotion. So. Product choice. Um, so big trusted brands had the fastest recovery from COVID. So Tui's, um, Forex, Han, et cetera. So they are still at trending at about 3% above the New South Wales average. Our premium brands, such as Byron Bay, Premium Lager, Stone and Wood, James Squire, Ginger Beer are also driving value growth of the category and consumers are looking to premiumize. So they're looking to spend more money. They, they might, there might not be as many transactions, but they're certainly looking to, when they're out in trade, to, to maximize and, and premiumize their spending. Make sure you have a sessionable craft beer on tap. So a James Guy Broken Shackles, for instance, a Lager or even a Lashes, um, a Kosciuszko, Little Creatures, Pacific Ale. These are the kind of brands that are sessionable, i.e. you can have a couple of them and still um, you know, feel like you're, you know, you're not sort of, um, your taste buds aren't going crazy. Um, so yeah, the, the, I definitely recommend that. And then as I've mentioned, White Claw is, um, is one that you should definitely be looking to, um, to range. If we look at the segments over the last 10 years, the contemporary beer segment has gained 10% market share in the last five years. So that's that blue middle bar in the, on the right-hand side there. Craft is still under 10% of the total market, but its growth trajectory um, is, is large and has a high share of the on-premise. So on-premise, craft in the on-premise is a lot bigger than craft in retail. International premium has seen the biggest um, decline in share since COVID with consumers choosing more local trusted brands more often. And as a category, um, as the category is in decline with wellness trends, uh, resulting in consumers reducing their alcohol consumption in all three segments um, play a key role in the future of the category. So, you know, with the health and wellbeing trends of, um, you know, just sort of just people sort of more looking after themselves, brands like Han Super Dry being low carb, and there's more innovation to come from Han Super Dry. Brands like um, Ultra Crisp through Han as well, which is soon going to be called Super Crisp. Things like this definitely should be um, looking to range them as people's health and well-being become, um, you know, more prevalent and they're more conscious of what they're putting inside themselves. How to get more revenue? So, speed of service tools to help promote um, higher, you know, especially in higher traffic venues. Why? Why would you do jugs? So, improves your speed of service, lifts your lifts your um, patron spend, um, extends patrons' time in in venue. So. They are very contagious in terms of the shopping. So if you see someone else drinking a jug, you also sort of feel inclined to, to purchase one. Um, and it's more appealing in terms of the price points to engage consumers. So we do have jugs available. We do have these sort of um, uh, perspex um, tap talkers available also that you can, you can put up. Um, and the next page, we can also see that 
we're starting to roll it into some clubs, um, some beer towers. So increasing basket size, occasions, so sports um, and, and music, so good for events, lifting spend and volume and redu reduction in the um, service times. So if there's any interest in any of them, please reach out to your line sales executive and, and, and share your interest and we can definitely look to um, try and help you with that. Next page, please, Margot. And some more ways to increase your margin pool. So, you, you know, if you want to lift your spend per visit, um, you need to sell more beer. So how you do that is pick your most popular brand and your trade up format. So you'd be looking to trade customers up. So for instance, in this example, it's a Forex Gold in a jug. If you want to sell better beer, so your high margin beer, you pick a trade up brand and the most popular format. So you might go a, um, a, a Stone and Wood Pacific Ale in a schooner. That's going to trade people up. And if you want to drive foot traffic and increase loyalty, you pick your most popular brand and your most popular format. So it might be Forex Gold or a Two is New in a schooner glass. So just a few more slides here, just looking at training and sustainability. So line draft quality, uh, we've got a big team across the nation. We've got a number of people in, in the state, draft quality specialists who um, do both proactive and reactive calls in trade. So our proactive service, so line draft quality team will call on partner venues free of charge on an average of three times a year to initiate pro, proactive and training-based calls. Um, the cost saving of this, so based on an $80, $80 an hour rate over six venues, um, collectively, this would add about 1,400 per annum in terms of a cost saving. We do a lot of troubleshooting, so either on the phone or on site, troubleshooting to resolve beer system issues. We do minor repairs um, and sometimes in conjunction with Andale, our exclusive beer um, reticulation partner, we, we were able to supply parts, not at free cost, but obviously, you know, we can get quotes for that and also quoting to assist with any beer system upgrades or looking to put on extra taps, et cetera. So that's, you know, that's something that we, we've been doing for a number of years. Um, you know, we're talking 30, 40, 50 plus years. Um, and it's certainly a service that the trade the trade love and it's very much available to anyone. Obviously, line partner customers are our priority, um, but certainly we're there to um to support to support venues selling the best quality beer. And venue and staff training. So um, there's also an ability for our draft quality experts to uh, do some training. So clean glass and perfect pour presentation is one area of training. Reducing wastage is another area, and then also beer tap and system maintenance. So these are the three things that we can really focus on to make sure that your lines, your pouring, and your presentation, and obviously reducing waste. So you know, helping with your overheads um, is a certain focus. And beer education is also available on request and can be performed um, either face to face or virtually. So that's definitely on a case by case basis, but. Um, you know, certainly line partner customers, we want to make sure that they are, um, you know, definitely armed with the right tools to be able to sell as much as much as they possibly can and obviously present their beer in the best possible way. And then last page here is just a little bit of a plug for, for line and all the great things that we're doing in the corporate social responsibility space. So quick, quick things to, sorry, six quick things to share here. Um, first one is we have had a 28% reduction in our carbon emissions since 2019, and that's progressing well um, to our target of 55% reduction by 2030. Our packaging now includes 52% of recycled content, so beating our target by four years. We've released carbon neutral zero alcohol beers in both Australia and New Zealand through Forex and Steinlager. Um, the fourth one is look out for the state's first electric beer truck that's now fully carbon neutral and it's delivering beer from Tui's Brewery in Lidcombe across pubs and clubs in Metro Sydney. Little Creatures is the official beer partner of the Sydney Mardi Gras and the Sydney World Pride 2023. And lastly, we have a partnership with Gotcha for Life, which is a mental resilience training program, which is being rolled out to line employees, but also to customers that are in need and regions that are in need. So look out for those things. Um, we're certainly proud of everything that we do from a 
corporate social responsibility point of view. I, I personally don't think that we really broadcast it as much as we could. So, um, but yeah, it's certainly good to have the opportunity to share some of those great things with you today. So appreciate everyone's time. Thank you and hope you um, got some value from that. Okay, thank you, Julian. I think I was a bit tricky to hear before. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay, brilliant. Um, Julian, I did get one question um, specifically with regards to the beers. Um, oh, and before I say that, I will say um, the mark of a true professional is how they handle technological challenges. And Julian, you just rolled with the punches. So well done. Um, oh, just uh, pushing through that uh, uh, that early, uh, early technical blips. Um, I've got a question. Are there statistics on sugar levels in the beers as well as the alcohol or is there a correlation in any in any way with regards to sugar and alcohol content look i can probably get more specific info from me if we can find out who that question was from yep. on average beer is 99 percent sugar free so we launched a program about five years ago years ago called beer the beautiful truth um and it was a it was a initiative that we weren't promoting our own brands it was a total category promotion where we spent a hell of a lot of money to um i guess debunk some of the myths about beer and one of those myths is that beer is super fattening it's high in sugar um and it causes beer guts etc cetera, etc cetera. no doubt you know if you drink a lot of it it's going to because it's still calories but the sugar content in beer is actually quite nice so on average 99.9 percent .9 sugar free um, it's le a beer, um, same size, is less than a glass of milk or less than a glass of orange juice in terms of sugar content and calories. But no doubt if you're drinking, you know, two litres of orange juice a day, you're going to get a beer gut so, or, or a gut, I should say. Um, but, yeah, if, if you want some more information, we can certainly provide that. Um, I'm not sure if that answered the question or not, but, yeah, it's certainly something I can find out. Sure. Mike, let me know if you wanted any more information. Um, and Steve, I think we answered your one. How does it, um, like we got a question partway through, um, how does the system handle end of month stock takes? So I think we covered that one off towards the end of the presentation. Yeah. Um, look, I will say um, I don't have any, I'll just check for more questions. No, don't have any other questions yet. I think the interesting thing, um, well, so many interesting things in both presentations, um, but it did certainly give me an insight that um, clubs, if they're working with their suppliers, either um, uh, Hospitality Genie or Lion, like as an example, some of the, both of the statistics you had, both of, you know, dashboards and all of those sorts of things is a helpful reminder that, you know, your your suppliers will actually have a lot of insights on what's happening in the market. And so make sure there's that open dialogue about what can we be doing to, you know, increase our profits, um, you know, decrease our costs, increase our efficiency. I know you and I, Steve, had a talk before about, you know, staff levels and how much we need to automate to really get it, keep ahead of the game. Like, you know, where as venues, we want to be first choice venues. And so, all of these ideas are definitely helpful as ways to, um, like you were saying, Julian, keep people in the venue longer, get them ordering more, get them ordering premium. Um, so I think that, you know, that was all incredibly helpful. Um, the other thing I was thinking about um you know, in terms of <laughs> Celsius, Julian, um, and it depends what your um, point of reference is, but I know even watching um, a lot of reality TV shows that are American these days, and I'm showing, you know, the lo lowest common denominator here, but you notice how often they're drinking White Claw. And so, you know, I think it's interesting that we always need to have a variety of inputs to see what people are eating and drinking. Um, but certainly I've been increasingly surprised by the amount of diversity in drinks and, and food, whether or not it's, um, you know, Celsius or low alcohol, no alcohol, you know, Steve, you and I were talking about vegan um, earlier today. So, I mean, you guys get the statistics. And so, yeah, I think it's important for clubs to ask you, you know, what's coming and, and really take that on board. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. We've certainly got a, a, a team working on, you know, that whole better for you category. Mm. and everything that we do is sort of all around you know that that is a main focus for us because that's what consumers definitely now and the drinkers of tomorrow are looking for 
Mm, Which so, people yes, probably wouldn't point. think to go to you guys to talk about wellbeing, but, you know, you're obviously, um, it's on your radar and something that you've got a lot of data on. Totally, and, yeah. And and seltzers are that because effectively they are just a, it's a, it's a sparkling water with a hint of flavour with alcohol in it. So a neutral spirit or some are, some are malt-based, um, yeah. but they are, you know, versus a beer or versus a wine or versus spirit, like some spirits, um, they, you know, on average are, are a lot less calorie dense. Yeah. And Margo, with um, with Hospital Genie, that's where you get the, the benefits of these dashboards about being able to track what's selling, what's not selling without having to pull all these detailed data reports. You can create these snapshots on the dashboards that actually show you what your top 10 sellers are, what's moving, what's not. So you can keep it fresh and be on the front mind and always be ahead of the game and change it and adapt to your, what your market wants. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Because and, and I guess that's the thing, we're time for, so we really do need dashboards and insights that don't take a whole lot of interrogation right. um, that really are upfront and, and easy to use. Definitely, yeah. Um, any, I mean, I'm conscious of time, um, uh, you know, and I think in general we're looking at, at changing trends, changing dynamics, and so every day, you know, we've, we're in this state of flux from the you know pandemic and um you know floods and all of those sorts of things but changes are coming every day in the way people you know julian you touched on hybrid workers and i think that's a massive opportunity for clubs of you know like you say either getting people back in for friday drinks to clubs um for lunches you know encourage them to do their corporate team building days on site or like you know staff training or um you know workshops as well as their lunches and everything um so i think there's a lot of opportunity for clubs in a huge amount of ways whether or not they're working out of out of clubs as a remote worker and and you know sitting there and needing somewhere just that isn't home because they need a bit of variety but that they know they can get um you know good food friendly staff a safe environment all of those sorts of things sure um, yeah and i think there's no reason why you couldn't do a, a, some kind of initiative as a club, you know, round up your friends who work in the area and come in for your Friday after work drinks. Yeah. You know, I like that's everyone, perfect everyone for needs it. to do that in the city. So, you know, there's no reason why that it, it shouldn't, it shouldn't survive and it shouldn't, um, you know, work really well in, in, in the suburbs. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'll just, so we touched a little bit on staff training um, with regards to what Lion can do with partners. Um, I think other than that, um, Steve, you mentioned there's some micro-credentials um, being rolled out potentially by the government soon for the hospitality um, industry. So we'll keep an eye on that space. I think it's fair to say that we have been um, venues or clubs potentially have been holding back on training so we would encourage you both from a getting staff up to speed because there might be a, a whole raft of new staff given we've had skill shortages but also from a team building point of view you know work with your suppliers and your partners to work out what staff training looks like because it could actually be a great team building thing but it does focus on wastage and quality and making sure that um, the products we're rolling out are as they're intended to be and there isn't you know we're, we're focused on costs and wastage um, you know we've talked a little bit about serving formats pricing margin, um, savings, automation, and some of those new new segments. Um, Julian and Steve, uh, Steve, I might start with you. Any last thoughts on the road to recovery before we wrap up? Look, I, I think that the main thing is, um, as, as all businesses, no, no matter what size you are, um, as we know, there is a skill sh shortage at the moment, but it's all about that automation and allowing us to get the data that we need at the tip of our fingers and not having to drill down. We're all time poor. Everyone's working harder than we've ever worked because you know, we need more people. But as much of automation that you can achieve within your business will help you then focus on the business to be able to you know, drive more sales, drive better efficiencies, and obviously profitability, which we all need. So, Julian? Um, yeah, look, the only other thing that I'd probably touch on would just be sort of around that digital space. Um, you know, the more that you can do, obviously I touched on menus, et cetera, but the more that you can do to try and tap into consumers, the younger demographic, the people are going to be coming in and spending in that digital way. 
um, I think that's going to be huge for the future. So um, no doubt there'll probably be more sessions on that moving forward. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's probably just another little add-on that I'd, I'd probably just um, yeah share. Yeah. So putting your drinks, a full list of drinks and and food online, so that everyone can look at it beforehand. Um, using any promotional. Um, uh, opportunities you have within the club on site as well um, and then I also I think you touching on some of those um, options around um, you know on tap jugs all of those sorts of things to, to scale up the venue and get everyone to stay in the venue as long as possible absolutely Great. okay I'll just check the questions one last time no I think we've covered them and I'll just share um, both Steve and I probably will clarify Steve so you wear two hats um, so for everyone's benefit um, they can obviously work with Hospitality Genie um, uh, irrespective of, of whether they're doing work with um, Catering HQ um, so uh, yeah just just clarifying that as well. Yeah so Hospitality Genie is the is the software um, which we're, we're partners with um, so, yeah, if anyone wants to get to know more about Hospitality Genie, more than happy to make time and, and come and do a, a more detailed presentation, not a, such a quick snapshot as I did today. So, <laughs> but there is a lot, a lot, of, a lot in it um, and there's a lot of information behind it. Thanks for sharing. So there's Steve and Julian's details. Um, at the RSL and Services Clubs Association, the, just to refresh on the team, um, myself, Brad, who you'll see there, who we probably wouldn't have got this last through this last hour without, <laughs> um, Kylie and Sarah, our accounts manager. So don't hesitate to let us know if you have any future webinars you'd like to see, if you have any feedback on this one. Um, and thanks for joining us today. Have a wonderful mm -hmm. day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Thanks, Margot. Cheers. Okay, thanks. Bye.